just good and cozy. Let's go ahead and stand again. We're going to read God's word together. And today, we're going to read it literally together because I forgot to do my thing. The, the honest answer is I forgot to do it. So, but I think it sounds nice with us all saying it together. So you guys ready? Okay. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against his holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I don't know why, but I got thinking about funeral eulogies. I was saying elegy before, but I'm like, elegy, no, that's, that's something different. But many funeral eulogies will say something like this. Oh, Al was so young, only 41, but he sure lived life to the full. Or Susie was taken from us way too soon, but she lived life to the full. Likewise, we can be encouraged by those we know or encouraged by advertisers or those social media influencers to live life to the full. In fact, one site that I saw, 64 reasons or ways you can live life to the full. No, I didn't click on it. The Bible also encourages us to live life to the full. How we define that idea, though, of living life to the full, that's a huge thing that we need to tackle. And also, how, how are we to achieve a, a goal lofty as that, to live life to the full? In the world, somebody that's 41, he lived the life to the full. It means he had all of the toys and he had all these things going on and he had the fastest motorcycles and he had the fastest boats and the fastest uh, snowmobile and all that. And he died in a fiery crash. But he lived life to the full. The Bible tells us of how we're to live life to the full. Today we're going to see a man whose life on the outside looks like it got cut short, but he lived life to the full. You see, our our lives are hid in Christ, aren't they? Or they're not. But if our lives are hid in Christ, our life is meant to be lived to the full. In the text today, we see The word full used multiple times to describe Stephen. An example was last week from verse 6. He said, the word says, And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Full is the word play race. Other forms of it are pleru. You might have heard that one. But this is play race. It speaks of a soul thoroughly permeated with whatever it's being permeated with. What's your soul being permeated with? It's a pointed question. But what a great word. When we see these five things that Stephen is full of, remember that, that he is thoroughly permeated with those things. That's what it means. 
Some people, you see, are just full of themselves. But God is calling us to be thoroughly permeated with his goodness. Stephen was a man who lived life to the full because he was full of five things, the word tells us. Faith, power, wisdom, the Holy Spirit, and the word of God. So let's look at verse 8. It says there's Stephen and Stephen. Who was Stephen? Well, we learned of him for the first time last week in verses 1 through 7. Stephen was a Hellenized Jew. You remember there was a dispute. There was the daily distribution of food. And there was a dispute among the Hellenized Jews, Jews that were dispersed, and they were in Greek cultures. And so their, their Judaism was mixed with Hellenistic type thoughts and language, and there was a, a dispute. Our widows are not getting the food that they deserve. And the regular old run-of-the-mill, ordinary Jewish person, they were at, at odds. And the apostles knew, hey, we better do something about this. They also knew that this is not a job for us. We need to stick to the teaching of the word, but let's appoint seven men full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit. This was no unimportant matter that they would be full, permeated, thoroughly permeated with those things. And Stephen was the first one listed. And it said that he was full of faith. Completed Jew, Hellenized Jew, a deacon, not an elder, not an apostle either. He was not an apostle. Not with a capital A, certainly, because all of us are apostles, lowercase a. We're all sent. If you know Jesus Christ, you are sent to go share the gospel with others, whether that's one-on-one -on -one in a home or going to certain places or going out on the street, whatever the thing is. He also needed to be of a good reputation. So we know that Stephen must have been of a good reputation because they chose him. He's the first one listed. And then he is full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom also because they selected him. He's the first one listed in those chosen, chosen or appointed to administer the daily distribution. Do you think he was faithful in those duties? But God doesn't always just have us doing this one thing. And at all times, whatever that thing that we're supposed to do, we can share the gospel with anyone, anywhere, anytime. So the first thing we're going to look at is that he is full of faith. Now, either that phrase is repeated there in verse 8, but if your Bible has a note like mine does, it says that the NU text, which is a combination of an Egyptian text and another text, uh, that text says the word grace, charis. But I think this one's correct. But maybe we'll add that as number six, because there's five things that we're going to see that Stephen was full of. And he was certainly full of grace, wasn't he? So full of faith. Full of faith. We talked last week. A person who's full of faith is such an encouragement to be around. Some people can look at the person full of faith and go, hey, whoa, 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 slow down there. And I agree, there, there needs to be a balance. It is a dangerous thing to have a guy that is filled with a gift of faith, that supernatural gift of faith, if there's no checks and balances. That person could get the church into trouble, couldn't they? Or get their lives into trouble. But man, I would rather err on the side of being full of faith than not. Amen? I want to be full of faith. Full, permeated, thoroughly permeated. Every core of your being, your soul, infused with the faith 
that is in Christ. Let's get that straight first. I don't want you walking out of here. I believe it was John Corson who gives the image of the abiding in Christ and that there was no grape ever that, you know, he just makes a favor. Oh, I'm going to make myself a powerful grape, you know. No, we abide in Christ and his goodness comes into us. That's how we'll grow in faith. Because the faith, the object of our faith is so important, isn't it? A lot of people have faith in their 401k. Whoops. Hopefully (laughs) I didn't make somebody really sad, but it's just money. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Don't worry about it. Faith. See, our faith is in Christ. It's not in some idol. It's not in this or that. It's not in our wealth. It's not in our intelligence. It's faith in Christ. That's where it all begins. Faith. It's trust or confidence in the unchanging, perfect character of God. So now that we have that straight, let's discover what faith is. You know these verses, I think. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. When you hope for things in the world, there is no substance to it. There's nothing behind it. But when we hope in Christ, there is, the word says there is substance to it. And evidence of things that are not seen. In that same chapter, verse 6, it says, But without faith, it is impossible to please God. I have to have faith in God. And if I don't, nothing I do will ever please Him. Because everything that I'm doing, as Romans will tell us later, if it does not proceed from faith, it is sin. Hebrews verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. That's step one. Do you believe that God is? I do. God is. And then we also must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If we half-heartedly seek him, we're going to get half of God in a sense, right? But if we diligently seek him, I believe God will reward us for that. We get into the private place, we're studying God's word, we're alone with him. You, you, you know, you know. I can't count the times I don't have enough fingers and toes to count the times where I come out of that prayer closet and, Heather, look at this. Or Heather's doing it to me. She's interrupting my quiet time, which I actually don't mind. She's cracking into my quiet time and going, check this out. Look what the Lord just showed me. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In other words, faith is the utmost confidence in an unseen God. Moulton and Milligan put it this way. Faith is the title deed of things hoped for. I like that. You got the title deed. And how did you get it? By faith in Christ. And this is a verse that, uh, and it'll be up on slide five here, Romans 14, 23. I mentioned it just a while ago, but this is one that causes a lot of commentators to try to side ways go around this. But if you think upon this, if you meditate upon this verse, and do so, and if you disagree with what I think, this, I'm going to tell you what I think about this verse. I think that this is universal. That whatever I do, if it doesn't proceed from faith in Christ, not the strength of my own faith, my strength is in him, my faith is in him, if I do something out of my own strength, and it doesn't proceed from my faith in Christ, it's sin. Let's talk a little bit about just one issue within the church that I think becomes a form of legalism very quickly. Tithing. 
giving to the Lord. If a person gives 5% to the Lord, are they sinning? No, because they're in relationship with Jesus Christ. And if God has instructed them to give five, because you can't make the word of God tell us that there is a tithe of 10% and everyone must give that. It's not there. But if the Lord tells you to give 20 or 40%, you likewise ought to be ready to do, because I'm in relationship with God. If he tells you to give 90%, If I have my faith in Christ, I know he's going to take care of me. Classic example, J.C. Penney. He started giving out 10 or 5. I don't know where he started, but I know at the end of his life, he was giving 90% of a very large income, by the way, away. 90% of it. He found that as he got to 50 and 60 and 70, he couldn't help but realize that God just kept giving it back to him. And I think there's an important factor to this that we need to make sure that we say. We don't want to walk out of here and go, oh, well, I'm going to give 60 so God blesses me. Incorrect, wrong, I did not say that. What I am saying is that if God tells me to give 50% and I simply obey him in his instructions to me as we're in fellowship and in relationship, I am going to be blessed. He is going to take care of me. It's a matter of faith, you see. It's about faith. My faith is rooted and grounded in Christ. The object of our faith. You see, we're dealing with a God that owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That is a fact. You can't outgive God, and God loves a cheerful giver. All those things are true. But what is God telling me to do? I don't ever, if I've ever laid a bad trip on anybody about, oh, you've got to give 10%. I heard a statistic that only 7%, and I think this is, doesn't even come close to being true in our church, and it doesn't matter. But they say 7 to 8% of a church body give on a regular basis. I think that's a little weird, I'm just saying, and I'm not saying it for my own benefit. I'm just saying for the person's benefit. But if God has given you freedom to not give because this isn't the season, you need to obey the Lord. Otherwise, we wind up with this 10%. You got to, this 10%, you got to, you know, and then it becomes a law. Now I'm obeying the law, not Christ. Isn't that what... Paul warned the Galatians about, oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you are taking the grace of God and now adding law to it? We are under grace, brothers and sisters, and that goes for every aspect of our lives in Christianity. Should you read the word every day for at least an hour? You you should do that. But if you don't, God still loves you. And, and, and if I'm brand new in the faith, if I get five minutes of prayer, that's pretty, pretty solid. Again, we don't want to be laying some heavy trip that we can't even bear ourselves. We're all under grace. I hope that makes sense. If not, we'll talk about it. I'm sure you'll let me know that. that hey, I don't think that made sense. If we are full of biblical faith, then the natural companion of that faith is going to be power. Stephen's full of power. It says here in the word, Stephen is full of dunamis. He's full of pistis, the faith. He's also full of power, the dunamis. When you add faith, and you got faith, a man of faith or a woman of faith, and you add God's, let's get that clear, this is God's power, not your own, God's supernatural power added to faith. Oh boy. Dunamis power. Your soul being thoroughly permeated with his power. Not for your own benefit. Not so you can get rich. So you can live a full life. And what does a full life look like? It's one lived by faith. By faith. 
We are to live by faith. And when we live by faith, a natural companion, again, is the power. Power needed to perform miracles. I want to remind us, Stephen was a deacon, not an apostle. He was a deacon, and he was performing wonders and signs. And what was he performing? He was performing miracles, wasn't he? Those are miracles that were happening. The word says he was performing miracles. What is a miracle? A miracle is something that cannot be explained with natural things. It is supernatural. Do you remember our friend that for his entire life he had never walked? And, and the apostles come upon him and they say, Stan, and he dancing. That lame man was healed. No doctor could ever explain that. It's supernatural, right? They had faith. It started with their faith in Christ and God gave them power to do things on his behest. This power comes from without a person, doesn't it? It doesn't come from within. It comes from without. Stephen, this power he had was given to him by God. As a result, or a natural consequence, however you want to put it, of his genuine faith. God is looking for people of genuine faith. He wants me. He wants you to have a genuine confidence a 100% ironclad, I don't care how things look. I don't care how sick I feel. God can do it. That's faith. And I want to be around. I want to be that person who has that kind of faith. I believe in the goodness of God. Though they slay me, I will still believe in the goodness of God. But I do want to mention, and we have to mention, that without faith, power of God is a very dangerous thing. You see, there is something outside of us in the supernatural realm, and if it's from God, it is good. But don't you know there's other powers that can create unnatural, supernatural things? What do I mean? Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians. Some of the verses will be up there, but I want to read the whole chapter. <laughs> it's, just, it's just one of those chapters you can't not read the whole thing. And it's only 40,000 words. No, I'm just kidding. It's only 17 verses. I don't know if we'll go to the, the whole thing, but we'll get to the gist of it. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He begins verse 1. Paul talking to a Thessalonian church that has been shaken by false teaching. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be so soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us. We didn't send this. This doesn't have our stamp of approval. As though the day of the Lord had come. Somebody had told this church that, sorry, fellas, you missed it. You missed the rapture. Show's over. You missed it. And they were shaken by that. They're like, what did I do wrong? Did I not follow the law well enough? What did I do? You see what happens there. Condemnation. Let no one deceive you by any means, that for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin, the Antichrist, the man of sin is revealed and the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worships, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. When will that occur? At the midpoint of the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation, three and a half years, the Antichrist will come and declare that he is God. He'll come into a rebuilt temple, and he will declare, I am God. And he will perform, watch this, do you not remember, Paul says, that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, 
that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. We, we see that, don't we? If your eyes are open, you see that the mystery of lawlessness, it's already at work. The, the lunacy that's out there. Only he, capital H, who now restrains, who's that? The Holy Spirit, will do so until he is taken out of the way. Whoa. What? What? You mean as bad as it is, the lunacy that's out there, this is nothing compared to what's going to come upon this world during the tribulation? That's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what this word is saying. And then the lawlessness will be revealed whom the Lord will consume. Oh, thank God. It's only for a time. If you don't give your life to Christ now, during this dispensation, you will go through the tribulation. And it will be very difficult to come to Christ then. And much easier if you do it now. You, you, need, you need to do it now. Like, I mean, today, if you're not in the kingdom of God, you need to do it today. Because look what he's going to do to this antichrist. He's going to just consume him with a breath of his mouth. It is written in the infallible word of God. And if he's going to destroy the Antichrist, he's going to destroy anyone who decides to reject Jesus Christ and live for sin. And he's going to destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's all it's going to take. His glory, the brightness of his coming. Wow. Wow. The coming of the lawless one is in accordan, according to the working of Satan. Where is he getting his power? Where is the Antichrist getting power? Where is the Enneagram getting power? Where is New Age getting power? Where is Christian yoga getting power? From Satan. And notice this. This is, by the way, this, is, <laughs> this seems like a long, like how do you get over there? Well, right, let's bring it back to our passage. This is why this is here. Because God does incredible signs and wonders through ordinary people, even today. Yes, even today. But will there be and are there now false signs and wonders? Yes. That's what it says here. With all power, signs and lying wonders. Not all power is of God. Some powers are demonic. And we just need the Holy Spirit. That's the, the guarding of the Holy Spirit. We're guided by the Holy Spirit in all truth. But he does great signs and wonders among the people. What those are, back in Acts chapter 6, what miracles, what signs and wonders he does, we don't know. It doesn't say. You know why it doesn't say? Because the Holy Spirit didn't want to say what, what it was. That's why. It doesn't matter. It, what matters is a man full of faith, not in their own strength, in Christ, full of power, demonstrating God's power through him so that people can see God's power demonstrated. But listen, if you're full of faith and you're full of God's power, using it for his glory, you are going to face and stir up opposition. Sit in your seat, pretend to listen. You know, Satan's not upset with you. He loves to, like as C.S. Lewis said, he, he loves to get you just thinking about, what's that person wearing? That's ridiculous. And then you just miss the message. That's all he has to do. Little bits of distraction little bit of judgment of other people. Boy, he's put on some weight. <laughs> oh, what was the pastor talking about? Oh, oh, good message, pastor. How would you know you were judging people in church? C.S. Lewis talks about that. When that happens, see, look at verse 9. There arose. Have you noticed we've seen that phrasing quite a bit? There arose. When you have a man or woman of God full of faith, full of power, people will rise up against you. They'll come out of the woodwork. Things will happen.
And where did they come from? The synagogue of the freedmen, it says. Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen. A couple of notes there. It's not clear whether it's five or two. Uh, one writing, they suggested there was 480 such synagogues. Freedmen. What does that mean? They are Jews who were under bondage with Rome, and they had become free. The sad thing about these guys is they're arguing with Stephen, a man full of faith, a man of good reputation. You could trust what he said. A man full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, full of the word of God. And they're arguing with him. I don't think they're free at all. It's, it's ironic that they're called the synagogue of the freedmen. They're physically freed, but spiritually, they're still in bondage. Libertinos, they're not at liberty. Two more notes on this. One of the cities is called, or areas is called Cilicia. Cilicia. Main city in Cilicia, or one of them? Tarsus. Where was the Apostle Paul from? Tarsus. Next chapter, we're going to see Paul. We don't see him specifically here, but we're going to see him giving hearty approval to the stoning of Stephen. Well, spoiler alert, sorry about that. Yeah. Stephen's going to get stoned to death. Well, how can you bring a message of somebody's life being full when this man's life is, he basically got one message and they stone him to death? What kind of full life is that? There is a man full of faith, full of power, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom, full of the word of God, and he is fully in the presence of God. Listen, our lives, if we are indeed in Christ, our lives are no longer our own. We were bought with a price. We are his. Paul said, I consider my life, what was it? Dung. Like the sound of a bell, right? Compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing him. Listen, there's no full life outside of Christ. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's lies. You can have a full life if you get a nice car. Well, you get the nice car and then you get the, you know, the tire blows out and it's like, wow, that's an expensive tire. I didn't expect a tire to be $1,000. No, a full life is in Christ. One more point about this. Archaeology. How can we trust this word? Well, one of the ways is through archaeology. 100% of every location mentioned in the book of Acts has been verified through archaeology. Every single city, that means Alexandria, that means Cyrene, that means Cilicia, anywhere these guys go, it is verified by archaeology. They dig up stuff. Can you dig it? <laughs> and the people from the 60s go, yeah, man, I can dig it. <laughs> Stephen's full of wisdom. He's full of faith. And look at verse 10, and they were not able to resist they weren't able to resist the wisdom of Stephen. Where did he get it? Why was he such a wise guy? Was he just uh, brilliant? Oh, by the way, Paul's probably here, right? The Pharisee of Pharisees. Paul, at the time, Saul. He's listening to this guy. He's one of the guys, most likely, that Stephen is arguing with, and we're, what's Stephen? He's just this Hellenistic Jew that has a good reputation, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with faith, and pro Saul could be there just like, yeah, well, check this out. <laughs> and then Stephen's like, check this out. This is the power of God. 
The point is this. We often don't want to open our mouths because we don't have a degree. We, don't, we didn't go to evangelism school or whatever the thing is. Who am I to say anything to them? Who you are is a blood-bought, born-again Christian who has the cure for their disease in your heart. And we must speak. We must share. We are obligated. How, how bad a doctor would be is that if they knew you were sick, knew you had this cancer, could cure you in 10 minutes, and he says, you know, actually I have a tea time. I got, I got golf to do, so can't help you. Stephen, full of wisdom. Again, what is wisdom? Wisdom is the proper application of knowledge. The burner's hot, that's knowledge. When I don't touch the burner, that's me using the wisdom that I probably learned from touching it, right? <laughs> because wisdom can come from experience. We talked about this last week. But here's a curious aspect of this idea of wisdom. One can have wisdom, share it liberally with others. God gave me this wisdom by experience or by word of wisdom. He gave me a supernatural gift and I, I know how to fix something. I can give it out liberally. But that same person so often, and sometimes this is me, and sometimes it's you, you can have all this wisdom that you share with others, but then you fail to apply it to yourselves. Exhibit A, Solomon, right? 400 wives and 600 concubines. Now, I get it. A lot of those are just political. So he's not hanging out with those ladies, if you know what I mean. 400 wives. Raise your hand if you're married to a wife. Look at the men. Okay? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> you met imagine, okay, wives, let's give you equal time. Are you married to a husband? Could you imagine having 400 of those confounding people? He was the wisest. He was so wise to ask God. He could have asked him for anything. Ask me anything. And he asked for wisdom, and God gave it to him. That whole thing with the baby. Like, who, who would have come up with that? Nobody on this plane would ever thought, hey, I know what I'll do with these two moms. I'll, I'll say I'm going to slice the baby in half. And the real mom will show up then because the real mom will say, hey, don't touch that baby. Give it to her. I want the baby to live. That's wisdom. Where did Solomon get it? It's obviously not from his natural inborn wisdom, right? It was from God. It was a requirement for the deacons, wasn't it? To be full of wisdom, to be permeated with God's wisdom. And it's important that we have his wisdom, but then we make sure that we apply it. 1 Peter 2.15 says, Do good, do good, and then you will put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You know, we don't have to spend all day arguing with them. Just do good, and you will put to silence the foolish talk of ignorant men. Because the fact of the matter is this, worldly wisdom is no match for God's wisdom. Is that correct? That is correct. See, he was thoroughly permeated with the wisdom of God. I, I, I want that. For you, I want it for me. We need it in this world. And he's full of the Holy Spirit. He said it was one of the requirements. It doesn't specifically say here that he was full of the Spirit, but it does say that he was they were not able to withstand the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. A job requirement. To serve tables. That's weird, huh? Really? To serve tables? To do a garage sale? <laughs> yeah, even in a garage sale, we need wisdom. You know, because it gets hot and people get bothered. We, did, we didn't have any of that. Just you, know, you guys are already going like, okay, what happened, Pastor? Even if I knew something, I wouldn't tell you. Because God is a God who covers. To be full of the Holy Spirit is to be thoroughly permeated 
with the Holy Spirit. Power. Guidance in all truth. Wisdom. Peace. Discernment. Protection from the enemy. Always being reminded of Jesus' sweet words. His teaching. That's what it means to be full of the Holy Spirit. To be walking in those things. I don't know about you, but I sure would like a, a heaping dose of those things. And before we get any false notions, being full of faith, of power, of wisdom, and full of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit? What? <laughs> Can you edit that back there? <laughs> being, take two, being full of the Holy Spirit, there it goes, does not absolve us from troubles. In fact, I would actually have to be honest with you and say that it probably guarantees it. It guarantees that we are in this world going to have trouble. But it means we're going to be thoroughly equipped to handle it. And so these men come along and they secretly induce men to say, hey, I've seen that one before. Right? They tried to do that to Jesus. The word, the original language indicates that they're talking about money. They bribe these guys to lie. They secretly induce, the word is hupobalo, is only used once in the scriptures. To induce to bribe. To induce to bribe. And similar tactics were used against Jesus, weren't they? But what was the problem there? You remember the problem there? They couldn't get any of these false witnesses to agree. They're like, well, Jesus had blonde hair, and I saw him do this, and this other one, well, this, this guy, he had brown hair, short, and blue eyes, you know? And none of their false witnesses would agree, but in this case, it's odd, but they're agreeing. And we heard them say, we heard them say blasphemous words. Now, blasphemy is a serious charge. The penalty for blasphemy is what? Stoning, death by stoning, which, spoiler alert, is how Stephen's life is going to get cut short in just a little bit. Life to the full. I don't understand what you're talking about, Pastor. I think you do. There is no full life outside of Christ. But in Christ, think about it. Think about those that were here yesterday. Did you... You went away tired, let's be honest, right? It was hotter than blazes, right? It was hot. H-O-T with a little bit of H-O-T, you know what I'm saying? It was hot, like like really hot. Like, I mean, I was sweating. Sweating. It was hot. But what a blessing. <laughs> what a blessing to hang out with you and, and to fellowship with you and to pray with you. Right? We're blessed. So they stir him up and then they set him up. Verse 13. They stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes. They came together to seize him and brought him to the council. The council I don't know, it just struck me the praise and prayer night on Wednesday if you were here there's all these chairs here because we were getting ready for the garage sale, but we still wanted to have praise and prayer. So we had a big ring of seats, and then there was three seats in the front for the worship team. And that's just what the council was. Intimidation. Put you right in the center. Make it nice and hot for you. Get those heat lamps on you. Oh, they'll crack. We'll intimidate them into agreeing with us. They're doing the same thing they tried with Jesus. But the problem is, this man is full of faith, full of power, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, and he's full of the Word of God. Those kind of people are very difficult to intimidate, aren't they? And then they set them up. They also set up false witnesses. I thought about things that need to be set up. One thing that needs to be set up is a mouse trap. 
get it hooked up there and you put the little piece of cheese in there. Wham! Okay, that's one thing that just needs to be set up. Reality TV shows. Rick's not here anymore, but he verified that. The reality TV shows aren't real. They're actually a setup. Sorry to blow your mind. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure about that? Police stings. Those are set up. Idols. The idols that we worship, we have to set those up. You remember Dagon? Remember that idol? Like, this, is, this is our idol. He's going to be strong. He's going to go toe-to-toe with God, and he's going to win. Every morning they come in, and he's on his face before the true and living God. And so what did they have to do? Just like we do, if we want to have idols, we have to set them up. So he takes Dagon, sets him up there. It'll be okay. Stay. Good boy, Dagon. People who are paid to lie are also set up. And they earned their paycheck, baby, didn't they? They lied through their teeth. They were false witnesses against this man full of faith, full of wisdom and and the like. They were faithful to their God, the God of mammon, the God of money. And they said, we heard him. We heard him. We heard him say he's going to destroy the temple. Question for you, Bible scholars. Did Jesus ever say that he was going to destroy the temple? No. No. He did not say that. He said it will be destroyed. Who destroyed it in 70 AD? The people, right? Right? Not one stone. He predicted it was going to happen, but it wasn't him that did it. 70 AD, one stone not left on another. Matthew 5:17 answers the second of these two charges. He's trying to change the things that were passed down to us from Moses. Matthew 5.17 says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. To fill it full. And then our final verse, which is a bit of a problem for me, but we'll, because we got four things and I haven't gotten to the fifth one and I'm out of verses. But let's look at 15. And all who sat in the council looked steadfastly at him and saw his face as the face of an angel. What's going on there? Well, I immediately, I I think you probably do too, I thought of the transfiguration. You remember Peter and James and John are up on the mountain and they call it now the Mount of Transfiguration, the glory of Jesus, which was veiled. He always had it, but it was veiled because he would have burned your eyeballs out with his glory, right? For a second, for a a moment of time, Peter, James, and John saw the glory of Jesus. I mean, they saw him for three years and knew that he was glorious, but they saw a glimpse of his glory. Peter... God bless him. Because he sees Moses and Elijah. And he's like, this is so amazing. Why don't we build tents for the three of them? Let's build tents. Look at, come on. Let's stay here forever. But Stephen has a bit of that, doesn't he? I don't want to, I want to stop short of calling this a transfiguration. But somehow, some way, the, 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 appearance of Stephen has changed. And I think that's true. Haven't you seen that in other people, people that are just oozing Jesus? Have you seen that? I mean, my hope would be that there are times where it leaks out of me sometimes and leaks out of you. I can see it. Sometimes it's because we're doing with the Lord, but they see his face as a face of an angel. That's an important. What does the Bible say? about people's encounters with angels. Oh, look at the cute little puppy. 
Look at the cute little angel. Oh, he's an angel. We say that about kids' face, right? I say that about Jonathan all the time, right? Oh, look at that. He's such, a, such an angel. You know, men, angels, two separate things, right? But Stephen had a face of an angel. And when people see angels in the Bible, here is the normative response, fear. They are fear. They're not petting a fluffy puppy. Because this is an amazing thing. Just an ordinary guy, full of faith, full of power, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, full of, number five, the Word of God. Where are you getting that from, Pastor? You said five things, so you got five things. Where are you getting that? Well, all of chapter seven. We'll get to that in a couple weeks. Stephen was full of the Word of God. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you. When your face is shining like an angel, they're probably going to go, What's up with you, dude? Always be ready to give an answer for the reason, for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, you're doing good and they call you evildoers. That's going to happen. Be ready for it. You're ready for it. Because my my heart is filled with the word of God. I fill it with 1 Peter 3.15, which tells me this is going to happen. Those who revile your good conduct in Christ will be ashamed that they may be ashamed, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good rather than for doing evil. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And finally, one I'm sure you're familiar with, 2 Timothy 3.16-17, all scripture. Underline all. This right here. Thank you, Lord. How about that for an exclamation mark? It's like, preach it, my son. All scripture is given by inspiration, the breath of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. We need all of those things from time to time. For instruction in righteousness. How, how can I do the right thing? It's in the word. How can I do a thing that's, how can I not or avoid things that are unrighteous? It's in, it's in the word. Instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, and I love this, thoroughly equipped for every good work. If we were to do a funeral for Stephen, we could honestly and without reservation say he lived life to the full. I don't know how many days I have. I don't know how many days you have. But what I do know is I want to live my life for Christ and to live it to the full. I think that's what he wants for us. And I'm so thankful that, like he told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. If you want to live a life to the full, biblically, We must be full of faith. That's where it all begins. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But with faith, it's very possible. Full of power, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, and full of his word by his grace and mercy. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for this example of Stephen. And uh, Lord, thank you that he is with you. And he was one who lived a full life. Lord, help us to rightly define what it means to have a full life. If we need correction in that in any way, Lord, help us. But these are my brothers and sisters, and I know just about everyone in here. And we all have that same desire. We can get sidetracked easily. We all have that spiritual ADD. But Lord, draw us into the fullness of life in you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us a week this week like no other where we see your power demonstrated in our lives, not so that people can 
look at us, but they would look at your glory and say, that is something worth considering. Father, we love you, and we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand.